Thank you, Deputy Speaker, and thank you, honorable members of this House. Let me categorically state I own no properties uh, outside of Trinidad and Tobago. In fact, I own no properties in Trinidad and Tobago. There be family members who do. So I want to put that on the record because this comment comes not only from the member for Diego Martin Northeast, but a similar comment came from the member for Diego Martin West, the Prime Minister of the country. So I state categorically, I have no properties outside Trinidad and Tobago. I own none, and I have no interest whatsoever, Email proprietary email. interest in any such properties. So let me see, the, the um, Honorable Minister took us back <laughs> on a historical journey. <laughs> on a historical journey, talking about land and building taxes from 1920 to whenever. Yeah, but that 1920 law, over all these years, was repealed in 2009 and replaced by the Property Tax Act in 2009. So why this long looking back in the review mirror to talk about something that does not apply in the law of Trinidad and Tobago? Then the minister says, and of course really has to bring the member for Sapari into the free, that um, then Minister of Finance, Larry Hawaii, committed to a tax, saying it was property tax, and that uh, the member for Saparia, then Prime Minister, was sitting next to Minister Hawaii, and I was stumping my desk. Let us make it very clear. That is not what Larry Hawaii said. <coughs> what then Minister Hawaii said was that we were committed to a good and fair tax. And thereafter, Minister Hawaii, in an article, Trinidad Guardian, 22nd August 2015, had this to say. No, no, no. No, no, no. Just before the election, sir, the minister in Mert, who was then opposition member Zacchaeus. and then opposition leader, Dr. Keith Christopher Rowley, both made that comment of words said and spoken um, supposedly by then Minister Hawaii. That he was saying he's supporting the property tax, that he is going to put it in 2015 after the election and residential, commercial, um, all the other, other taxes. This is what the truth is. And we say, great is the truth. And it shall set you free. And it shall prevail. Great is the truth. And it shall prevail. Article Guardian, 22 August 2015. Gail Alexander. Finance Minister Larry Hawaii has said that opposition PNM leader Dr. Keith Rowley is completely wrong in his claim that the People's Partnership was implementing a property tax regime originally developed by the previous government. Article continues. Hawaii was responding to claims Rowley made at Thursday's PNM manifesto launch <laughs> just before the election in 2015. But Hawaii in a statement issued yesterday stated, it must be said clearly, the people of TNT can completely dismiss this claim as utterly false. No property tax has been implemented or is being planned for next year by the Kamla Prasad Visessa administration. How I continues, I can state categorically that cabinet has not considered this matter, nor has the matter been brought to cabinet for consideration at any time in the last two years. Any such claim is completely without basis and must be considered a total fabrication intended to create fear and anxiety. Email this again. The minister stated in January of this year, when the Prime Minister and government moved to make spending adjustments in light of falling energy prices globally, a commitment was made, and we intend to keep that commitment that the most vulnerable will not bear the burden of adjustments. Following the address to the nation on 8th January, we then met with energy sector stakeholders, as well as larger commercial interests in consultations on how we can reform our tax regime. During those discussions, prelim consultations were held 
on a possible industrial land tax for the very large companies, primarily in the energy sector. How I added, I would emphasize that I've consulted with the business committee on the sequences of an industrial land tax and subsequently land and building taxes on residential and commercial properties. The feedback I have received, one, that we should consider carefully the tax burden on individuals and businesses and the effect it can have on new investment, and two, that the process of implementation will be long and drawn out and will not provide immediate cash flow benefit to the Treasury. As a consequence, the matter has not gone forward. This is the truth. This is the truth. The Minister attempts to distort what transpired then, but will not tell us what has happened to make them change their minds. So, for example, in the year 2009, Mr. Talked about 2009 Act, in that debate, I recall my own contribution, but I remember another member of the Honorable House had also put forward one of the most passionate arguments against the destructive punitive property tax. The Hansard record of Friday, December 18, 2009 show that the pers that person would be none other than the Honorable Member for Diego Martin West, mm -hmm. Dr. Keith Rowley. Mm -hmm. Back then, mm -hmm. he stood up against his own PNM government, stood up against his own government and said, yes, then Prime Minister Manning. Then Prime Minister Manning. I know many people in this country, and I quote from the Hansard, for whom $100 is much money. There are many people in this country who are struggling to make ends meet, and such persons faced with an increase, whether 200, 500, or 600, they're living at the margin. He continued in that debate. In my constituency, there is anger, anxiety, and resentment at both ends of the spectrum. If you try to defend the indefensible, you create resentment and provoke people, and that is what we have at the moment. Too many of our citizens are questioning the government's priorities, and they are afraid that, as they are faced with this taxation, the monies could be used for things they would not approve of, especially in a climate where the government has given the impression, I do not really have to listen to you. While I'm here, I will do as I please, because you sent me here. This was said, said by then oh. Member of Parliament for Diego Martin West, the Honorable Dr. This is 2009, on this same property tax. He says, taxation is never a light matter. It is for the government to come clean and say exactly what we are doing. We cannot go forward under the guise that we fool them and the money will come in down the road when it is too late. Continuing, trust is the only thing that the people want from the government. Mm. And the only thing to ameliorate or to remove the anger, the resentment and anxiety associated with this tax is for the government spokespersons to come clean and say what we are doing. Continuing, imagine every single word, Mr. Deputy Speaker, of the Honorable Member for Diego Martin West still rings so true today. Mm. And I ask whatever happened in the last 15 years? Whatever happened, what changed someone from fighting for their poor constituents to now saying that the property tax is his number one priority? What changed? Delcy. What changed? Delcy. Delcy. And then that was 2009. The same member at the launch of the 2015 PNM Manifesto Property Tax. On August 20th, 2015, during the launch of the PNM Manifesto before that 2015 election, then Member of Parliament for Diego Martin West. Dr. Keith Rowley, stated his intention not to reinstate the property tax hmm. as had been previously discarded by the wow. partnership of wow. His intention not to reinstate property tax. And he said plans were in motion for the old land and building taxes system. Wow. Ria Rambali then of CNC3 asked, one of the more contentious issues in the last general election was that of the property tax. Where in the PNM manifesto is this addressed? Minister, well, not minister, then MP Colum Imbo's response was, it is not in the document. And this is one of the things we need to talk to people about, just like the other things. Dr. Rowley's response, let me take that one. I'm glad you raised that. I heard a UNC minister, I think it was a famous Prakash Ramada, 
telling people, the PNM will bring back the dreaded property tax. Mm, mm, telling mm, people, mm, this is pre, mm, just mm. before the election in 2015, mm, mm, mm. we'll bring back the dreaded property tax. So said, so done. Dr. Rowley continued, mm. let me make it abundantly clear. Mm. The property tax has already been dealt with. Mm. And what the government did years ago, the return to land and billet taxes in phases, and that is when he spoke about Minister Hawaii. So what has changed, I ask again, what has changed from 2009? What has changed from pre-2015? That today, this is a government, as we warned, we told you so, is bringing this property tax into full implementation, even though they denied that was part of their policy and their program. Mm -hmm. So Minister, when you come here to talk about the People's Partnership, thumping desks and myself, thumping desks and so on, nothing is further from the truth. I have been consistent in the last 15 years, consistently in the fight against the property tax. We have, decided, have been consistent in the fight against this dreaded, wicked property tax. As I said earlier, we have been fighting the PNM on this tyrant tax for the past 15 years. And what is painful to us is that in the past 15 years, under two terms of PNM government, the country has totally regressed. So if Dr. Rowley then, in 2009, was crying, people can't afford this money, his hardship, his suffering, his poverty, begging for poor constituents, now it is even worse. It is worse now. Every single price has gone up in the country. Everything has gone up. You know, when I, when I um, check back in that 2009 debate, I remember, and I want to repeat it because this is very important for all of us. I said that there is a book, which I think many of us have read. It is a house for Mr. Biswas by the very famous and renowned author, V.S. Naipaul, and I quoted from it, I want to quote again because we are back again on the homes and houses on this property tax. But bigger than them all was a house, his house, how terrible it would have been to be without it, to have lived without even attempting to lay claim to one's own portion of the earth, to have lived and died as one has been born unnecessary and unaccommodated. This is what a person's home represents, your house. Every person's goal or aim is to have a home to call their own without fear or favor, that they can shelter their family. The right to shelter is one of the most important, basic, fundamental rights. I said it and I repeat it today, no government has the right to implement any measure that threatens to take away a person's right to their home, their right to shelter. No government. It is a violation of our constitution. It is inhumane and cruel. Madam Deputy Speaker, I also repeat, I am of the view that this tax is not property tax. I believe it is a poverty tax that will further bring citizens to pauperization. I believe this property tax is a direct attack on the people by government. I believe it is an act of open warfare at a time when we have already been experiencing so much hardship with government-induced high prices and inflation. It is tragic now, that was 2009, you know, 20 Fast forward to today, fast forward to 24, after 15 years, this government, after spending half a trillion dollars of taxpayers' money, we are still living worse, a worse time of economic hardship, and government is once more threatening us with pauperization. Back then, the day that they were ignoring those on fixed incomes, the over 110,000 senior citizens on fixed incomes to find this money to dredge out to pay this property tax. All the people who worked in the government service, those with the minimum wage, take out of their pockets in a time of very severe financial hardship and recession. It should have been, you know what government should have done? The government should have done today what it should have done years ago, which was to bring a bill to repeal the property tax act. Repeal the property tax act. Repeal the property tax act. That is what we should be doing today. And so, um, Mr. Deputy Speaker, let's see what has happened since 2009. The legislative history. Legislative history. 
As I said, the Parent Act was passed in 2009, Property Tax Act in 2009, December of that year. Let's get this open, please. Yeah, thanks. 2009, Parent Law. Since then, Friday, March 15, 2024, two days ago, giving the opposition no allowance of a working day to do proper research. Friday, we were notified that we were summoned to this house today. Over the weekend, back on a Monday, no working day, which is normally the practice and protocol in the house. There is um, at least three clear working days in the standing orders that when you put a bill for debate or a motion, at least three clear working days. None of that was given to us, none whatsoever. Yes, sometimes we override it because they have the majority and it's overridden when something is of utmost urgency. What is the urgency? What is the urgency, I ask, Mr. Deputy Speaker, to summon us to meet today after giving notification on Friday? Again, with not a single working day. We were hastily notified to come today to debate amendments to that act that was passed 15 years ago in 2009. Since 2009, this government has brought five amendments to that parent act, the 2009 act. Today's bill represents a sixth set of amendments. Let's look at it. Parent act, 2009. Finance act, number two of 2015, 2015. Property Tax Amendment Act number 6 of 2018, Finance Act number 10 of 2021, Finance Act number 21 of 22, Finance Act, Finance Act number 15 of 23, five previous amendments. And then today, after amendments in 2015, they didn't get it right. After the amendments thereafter in 2018, they didn't get it right. After amendments in 2021, still didn't get it right. After amendments in 2022, still did not get it right. After amendments in 2023, still did not get it right. And I predict that after the amendments today in 2024, they still will not get it right. They still will not get it right. Indeed, in the haste and in the hurry, so quick to want to, uh, really, it's like a property invasion. You talk about home invasion, like a property invasion, invading people's property, their homes to grab as much money as they can get in taxes, and in such great was a hurry. I always talked about not normal, three clear days and so on, over a weekend, what's the urgency? Tell us what's the urgency, please. Tell us what is the urgency for us to be here today and not given the three clear days to come another day in this very sad week. What is so urgent? And so hurried they were, My, um, Mr. Deputy Speaker, that there is a typographical error in their clause 2A, that doesn't make any sense. In their clause 2A, they say notwithstanding the date specified in subsection 1, the date will now be June, June, uh, June 2024. But there is no 17-1, so how can you have a 17-2? You have nothing in 17-1, but they're so busy to try to grab money off of people's pockets. Still can't get it right. They cannot get it right. What that clause two a is a whole new, brand new section, all that 17, 17 capital A. Please, silence. So there is no section. Silence, members. Seventeen one. How can you have a seventeen no, two? Again, please. There is no seventeen one. So this will have to be corrected. I'm sure they'll bring an amendment. Bring. Mr. Deputy Speaker, I will not be badgered and bullied by this minister. Yeah, yeah. I will not be badgered and bullied. Yeah. When you are here seeking to grab money out of people's pockets, man, we say no property tax in this country. No property tax in this country. Zacchaeus, the tax collector. So, yes, <laughs> yes, that is what is happening. And 10 minutes. We move along. There was a state of chaos that ensued because of their incompetence over the last week and even before that. So we had, um, first of all, clause 2A of the bill now, which has to be amended, as I have pointed out. 
This clause has been inserted to provide for the year 2024 only that the BIR shall cause a notice of assessment to be issued on or before 30 June. So instead of a March deadline, now to be June. Why did this become necessary? It is partly due to the state of absolute chaos that ensued last week, even as government struggled to implement its property tax. For once, can this government stop playing their blame game and accept their own failure? But I guess that will never happen until maybe there are hailstones and snow in Trinidad and Tobago. First of all, in a paltry attempt at defending the chaos and incompetence, the minister on Friday in this very parliament said, and I quote, the implementation of the new property tax administration was not a simple exercise since we have effectively been navigated in uncharted territory and there will inevitably be teeth in issues. Mr. Deputy Speaker, teeth in issues. After 15 years teaching teeth in issues, are you for real? Hmm. Are you for real? This is ludicrous. You have teeth in problems, teeth in problems. So you now have a 15-year-old law, and you're blaming teeth in problems. Boy, if you see a child who is 14 years old having teeth in problems, something is terribly wrong. You better get the doctor in the house soon. Get them there fast. Show me a 15-year-old with teeth in his shoes, and that will be an indication something is very wrong. Mr. Speaker, well, Deputy Member, Speaker. Member for Separia. Yes, sir. Again, standing order 53. Remember, members not speaking. Please stand in order 53. Proceed, member. <coughs> Thank you very Proceed, much. Proceed, member. Thank you. Yes, yeah, so this, these, these can't be teeth in problems at this late stage in the game. And then the minister says, we listen to the population. We are here today and we have to make, because we listen. Oh, what a caring government we are, we listen. And this is why we are here now dealing with this bill. He said, the minister boasted that as a responsible government, the PNM had listened to the concerns of the population and acted. That is totally untrue. The truth is, had they listened to the public, there would be no property tax. No property tax. Last Friday, the minister outlined the objections to the property tax which were made by persons in the public domain. He said, one, there have been several cases of feedback indicating that the annual rental values identified in valuation notices are not consistent with the expectations of property owners or with the current property rental market. It's interesting, um, Minister speaking today, when he called other countries in the world, I think he said the US is just about market value he called a set of other countries in the world is about sales, the sales price. Is there any other country that deals with a ghost annual rental value hmm. that bases its valuations and assessments and so on on annual rental value? Ghost, ghost yes, it's a ghost value because, because there is no such thing as an annual rental value that is real. And therefore, the minister has to tell us how that is calculated. But anyway, back to saying, um, consistent, the notices are not consistent with the expectations of people, one. Two, residential landowners and occupiers in close proximity to each other have complained about discrepancies. Three, other residential landowners and occupiers have complained about what they consider to be the obscure manner to which same ARVs have been determined. In almost every case that the minister cited, the objection centered, centered not about the rate or not just the rate, it's centered on the annual rental value. It was being used to assess how much taxes you must pay. Three of the five areas of our objections centered around the method of calculation of the very basis for the assessment. So if the minister said, listen, today we will not be debating this, what is contained in this bill, we will be debating and changing the basis of the assessment. That is what the major concern has been the basis of the assessment away from an annual rental value, so, and that was a major area of concern. And do you know what the minister's answer was? MP Tanku, after the minister made a statement on Friday, asked, asked this question. 
whether any consideration was given to changing the basis of the assessment away from the ARV, since this was a major area of concern. What was the minister's answer? Completely ignored the question, saying that he has now given people six months to object. No answer whatsoever. If the concerns are all about this ARV, why is not that part of the legislative framework? If you listen, if you listen, but it's this stick break in your ears. You don't listen, and then you want to tell the country, want to tell the country, want to tell the country you listen. You listen, that's why you're here today. Other areas of concern stated by the minister, four, there are some duplicate valuation notices, and that too was totally ignored by the minister. And five, his minister said, this last set of objections came from people who felt that the property tax should have been based on the old ARV, that is the annual rate of value. Um, obviously, there was no annual rental value under the old land and building taxes. What existed was an annual rate of value, which is totally different. And the minister today, when he was doing history, talking about the old land and building taxes, didn't seem to, maybe he does know, but chose not, he chose to ignore that difference, the big difference whatsoever. So there were consistent objections. Will the minister stop mumbling and grumbling? He will have his time to reply, sir, so please. It's, it's just a constant mumbling and grumbling coming from the minister. You will have a chance to respond, sir. Can I get your protection? Again, members, sec I think this will be the third time for the evening about standing order 53. Again, let's don't let the chair has to enforce it. Proceed, members on the government side, please. Thank you very much, Deputy Speaker. Thank you. So there have been consistent objections to the use of the annual rental value. The fact that the population has been consistently objecting to use of the ERV as a basis of taxation. Again, I say the problem is with the methodology that should be currently under legislative review. And if this is a major issue of contention for those objecting, that should have been addressed by the minister. The minister has already ignored the vast majority of object objections, dismissing them, but telling the population that, and I quote, indeed the PNM government has taken stock of the various issues raised in the public domain regarding the valuation of residential properties and as a responsible government, taken appropriate action to alleviate the concerns as the new system is being revised. What is new in the system, Mr. Deputy Speaker? There is totally untrue to talk about a new system being rolled out. This has been the law from 2009. If the minister was indeed listening, as I said before, the minister would have come to completely remove this wicked property tax. However, none of these concerns about evaluation have been dealt with. Instead, when we look at the explanatory note of the bill, nothing in it addresses those concerns that the minister identified, nothing whatsoever. All the clauses, not one, handles the concerns that the minister identified, those five-point concerns. There's also a lack of um, transparency and accountability with respect to the method of valuation. The amendments today underscore the, underscore the fact that the entire, entire property tax implementation process, in my view now officially a failed process, is tainted with complete lack of transparency and accountability. Since last year, the country has been inundated with reports of citizens all over the country complaining about the unfair exorbitant valuations they have received. Many are receiving rental valuations that are grossly overstated. Others are receiving multiple notices with different valuations. I remember, again, the you same just have property. about a minute of your initial 15, of your initial Please, speaking time. You have an additional 15. You avail yourself. Please, sir. Proceed. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Yeah. Grossly overstated values, multiple notices with different values, discrepancies, valuations that make no sense to people that have uh, terrorized people with high rates. By now, we have seen so many of these accounts by citizens in the newspapers. And by the way, Mr. Deputy Speaker, where is the minister getting the information about 
What was the term? Somebody with two acres of land. In Tobago. And they, they want to pay $250. Where? They said, Pastor Brown is sharing this information. <laughs> Where are you getting this information? The minister should have no sight or insight into any of the objections being lodged. That is in the purview where they are to be lodged, the authority so to do. The minister has no finger in that agency and should have none. none. But then again, what do you expect when we have people at high offices talking about being spies and talking about government ministers being involved in all kinds of deals? So there have been so many accounts of these discrepancies. And it is madness, or with the greatest respect, the minister has rushed to parliament to correct this very serious, what he calls, teeth in problem. There's a very interesting article in yesterday's uh, newspaper by Janelle D'Souza, Newsday, March 17, 2024. Headline, homeowners want clarity on erratic property tax valuation. Property owners took serious issue with the valuation of their properties and the lack of transparency about how it was calculated. The article quotes Afra Raymond, managing director of Raymond and Pear, saying, and I quote, there were so many discrepancies because of the mass valuation approach, which will produce a certain percentage of erratic valuations. Six of the 10 grounds for objection listed at the back of the printed notices of valuation referred to the valuation role, but it was unavailable to taxpayers or the public due to its conflict with the Data Protection Act. And yet the minister comes here to boast of the amount of avenues there are for people to appeal, go to the tribunal, go everywhere. All these avenues, when it is here, is one. The grounds for objection listed at the back of the notices refer to the valuation role, but that is unavailable to taxpayers. So how can you list this as one of these great avenues that you speak of? And whilst we talk about that, uh, come back to it. If this fundamental defect is not rectified, the property tax could be effectively inoperable and vulnerable to judicial review as effective, unfair legislation, perhaps to the even to the extent of its being declared unconstitutional. Mr. Deputy Speaker, these are the words in the article coming out of that article that I quoted from. But I am also of respectful view that we are treading on very dangerous constitutional grounds here. And then the way this is being done, the inequity in the system, the discriminatory way, if you're a rental property or if you're a property owner, there's discrimination that that could be open to challenge in the courts once again. Once before, we had to take this government to court. We did it. We did it when they were sent out all these notices and assessments and bullying people and threatening people. And the court said, no, 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 no. The law is that it is voluntary. There's no force in doing it. So once again, here we come again, grossly unfair, with the mass valuations. So I ask a question, which I think my colleague attempted to have answered. Remember for Hoover South? South? about the staffing at the Valuations Department. In an Express article published March 16, 2024, economist Valmiki Arjun raised a key point. He says the government's move to extend the deadline to six months raises the question as to whether they have adequate staffing and other resources at the Inland Revenue Division to prepare the assessment. Do you have the resource ability to receive the taxes what is the mode of payment? And I believe um, um, Minister, the member for Kuva South attempted to have this question answered. So I'm going to ask it again. Would the Inland Revenue have the staffing and the resources to do what they're going to be mandated to do with these amendments? Minister spoke again about all these various avenues to deal with the implementation of the tax, what they said, avenue, yeah, avenues to, to um, help people to challenge the tax and so on. I come to the Valuations Tribunal. The issue of not having a tribunal is a very severe matter. The public can be left out in the cold. The legislation to establish the Valuation Tribunal was passed six years ago. So I'm, I'm MPA who say 2018. We are now in 2024. By Section 15 of the Act, 
the establishment and composition of the Valuation Tribunal provided for, and of course, they provided for up to one year for the commissioner to respond to any valuation objection, and thereafter, you could go to the tribunal. But up to today, there is no valuation tribunal. My colleague, uh, the member of parliament for Baratara Sanner, brought this to the attention of the, the public. And the president. At the press conference. And the president. The president. And the president. The MP wrote to the president to inquire whether, because I think the minister had said the tribunal was established. Not believe in him because I always say we don't believe anything they say. <laughs> so the MP for Baratara wrote to the president and said, have you established the tribunal? Because the tribunal is to be established by the president. The president responded and said, no, no. Responded and said, no. So you're sending out assessment notices. You're telling them, look, you have a chance to appeal to the commissioner, and then you could appeal to the tribunal. But there's absolutely no tribunal established. Will the minister tell us? when that tribunal will be established under the law, as mandated by the law. But this government, and the law reports are replete with judgments, with cases of failures to appoint tribunals and committees and so on. And, and um, it reminds me, you know, the government is in breach of the Constitution once again by its failure to lay in this house the report of the Elections and Boundaries Commission, which was due on the 14th of March, in breach of the Constitution, um, um, again, in member, breach of the law. Member, member, again, we don't need to go down that road. That's nowhere in the bill we are dealing with. Please. Thank you, sir. Mm -hmm. With respect to deferrals, respect to deferrals, I note now on the order paper today, deferrals were that persons, vulnerable persons, could apply for a deferral, they couldn't pay the tax, they were unemployed, old age pensioners, they were infirm, and for various other reasons, they could apply to get a deferral. But up to today, the regulations to allow people to apply for the deferral were never published, were never laid in the parliament, never became law. I only note, as I say, today, finally. So that's a, something that the minister, again, 2009 legislation, yes. No deferrals. And this whole issue, this whole issue of deferrals, Mr. Deputy Speaker, it's interesting. When the minister spoke about deferrals, was very, very, you know, exuberant about it. Hey, we're going to help the poor people and the infirm and the unemployed and pensioners and so on. But this is not that you will never pay the tax, you know. This is where they're going to defer it. And then when you die, it becomes a death tax. It is a death tax. It is an inheritance tax because your successor in title will become an inheritor of the tax. They will have to pay it. Yeah. So it is not like you defer it and it's gone. They inherit the land. And they inherit with it the burden of the land, which is the property tax. So let's not say for the poor people this is gone. Not say for the old pensioner and the unemployed. It's not gone. It's there coming back to bite you when you least expect it. So. Sir, again, Mr. Deputy Speaker, this dotish members, man. Please, please, please. Don't please. This dotish man. Member. Members, please. We are too early in the session. No, one second. Me Are you speaking if he's on his legs? Can I rise now? It seems like I have to ask again, members. It's too early in this session. Each member will have an opportunity to enter the debate. The Minister of Finance would have laid this bill. We now need to hear from the member for Separia. And again, right, and again, proceed. Thank you, Raj. I have five minutes left, so let's proceed. And now the minister comes uh, as well.
to give himself some other powers, it is. In the clause 2C, Minister attempts to move negative resolu affirmative resolution of Parliament to negative resolution of Parliament. What does it mean? If it were an affirmative resolution of Parliament, this is a change rates, eh? this is not any simple little matter. This is to amend the schedule which sets the rates, whether 2 percent, 3 percent, 5, whatever it may be. Now the minister wants to deal with it by negative resolution, what that means. It is put into place, a legal notice is published, it takes effect for 40 days unless there is a motion to negative. With affirmative resolution, what happens is it must come for debate in the parliament. I totally disagree with this move to take away affirmative resolution. And in 2018, you know, the minister tried to do the very said thing and was forced to back back and back down and remove the words negative and instead thereof affirmative. So why are we changing the minister? What has happened? And this is not something we come in every Friday to do, you know, say, oh, we don't want to come back to parliament, we don't want to come back to parliament. No, because you're dealing with the rate. So you're giving the minister this power to change the rate subject only to negative resolution. Why does the minister want to avoid parliamentary scrutiny? So on the issue of refunds, people, some people have already paid. There's no clear word as to what will happen to these runs, when they'll be paid. And um, we know that people are still waiting on VAT refunds over years and years and years. Uh, so if you have overpaid, will the minister give some indication and is winding up when and how the the funds will be executed. As I close, Mr. Deputy Speaker, I repeat that we are totally against the property tax because it is an unfair tax. It will cause more hardship on the population. We do not support whether it is 0%, 2%, 3%, any percent, the whole property tax act must go. Say no tape. I want to remind tax revolts in countries have really made a lot of regime changes. Huh? Let's remember that. History is replete with revolutions and wars that began because ordinary people refused to pay unjust, unfair taxes to tyrant leaders. Since the beginning of civilization, tax resistance has caused the collapse of several empires, including the Egyptian, Roman, Spanish, and Aztec. Tax revolts prompted events that overturned the world order, like the 1776 American Revolution, no taxation without representation. The 1784 French Revolution gave us liberty, equality, and fraternity. <laughs> And don't forget, you know, in 2009, Property Tax Act, the law passed by that government, 2009, was one of the pieces of legislation and one of the actions of the then PNM government, which brought down that PNM government early in 2010. And now we are in the holy season of Lent. Let's share the story from the holy text. The story of Zacchaeus. According to the holy text in Luke May 91. just have about two minutes. Mm -hmm. What? Just have about two minutes. Oh, well, that's fine for my quotation, sir. <laughs> I thank you for the, the guidance. Tax, the tax collector. This tax collector was very short, very rich, very corrupt, Ooh. chief tax collector in Jericho in the time of the Lord Jesus Christ. Like other tax collectors working for the Roman Empire, he was seen as a sinful figure of ill repute, self enriching, corrupt, and traitorous to his people. When Jesus passed through Jericho on his way to Jerusalem, he climbed up on a sycamore tree to see him because he was so sure. <laughs> to everyone's surprise, Jesus went to the tree and told him, he said, come down from there, come down, that he would be a guest, invited him to be a guest that day. And after this encounter with the Savior, he said, look, Lord, here now I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I'll pay back four times the amount. <laughs> In this holy time of Easter, Madam Speaker, this story symbolizes Jesus' open arms to all. And therefore, I call upon this government to do like he did, to repeal and remove this wicked property tax once and for all. 
repeal your tyrant property tax and call elections now and take yourselves out of government. I thank you very much.